Welcome to Peoples and Things, where we explore human life with technology. I'm Lee Vinsel. You know, the topic of race and technology has always been very important to me. But historically, whenever I've attempted to bring this topic into any of the classes I've taught, but especially the class I've taught for many years on the history of the automobile in the United States, I have run into the same frustrating roadblock. For example, when prepping that class, I would look into the Scholarverse and ask, what do we know about black people and cars? And the answer would come back, nothing. I would find that nearly zero research had been published on that topic or on any other consideration of race and technology. Now, luckily in recent years, this has been changing. Continuing to focus on cars for a second, there are several books that already have been, or we hope will be, on the podcast, including Mia Bay's Traveling Black, Gretchen Soren's Driving While Black, and Saren Saraceo's Policing the Open Road. But there's still so much to do. How do we do it? When I would do the most basic research into these topics for the classes, like put in terms for various technologies into databases of African-American newspapers, I would find a wealth of knowledge that no one had written about yet. Like historians have not bothered to do even the most cursory research into these topics. Maybe that is sadly unsurprising. But once we get past that basic stuff, then things get interesting because groups that have been marginalized in society often do not end up in the kinds of archives and databases that humanities and social science scholars tend to rely on. This is a famous and old problem. So you have to get creative. Well, what does that look like? One set of answers comes from the book we cover in today's episode, Writing Jane Crow, African American Women on the American Railroad by Mariam Thaggart, a professor of English at the University of Buffalo. Thaggart examines how black women experienced the railroad as passengers and as workers from the mid 19th to the mid 20th century. Along the way, she creatively pulls on many different kinds of sources to draw out the experiences of these women. In one interesting example, she reconstructs the daily lives of black waiter carriers, women who would bring and sell to passengers fried chicken and other prepared foods. And she uses drawings and photographs of these women to try and get a sense of what their lives were like. And the book is full of things like this. I had a great time talking with Mariam and I learned a lot from her. Hey, get excited. My guest today is Mariam Thaggart, professor of English at the University of Buffalo. Today we'll be talking about her book, Writing Jane Crow, African American Women in the American Railroad, as well as some of her other work. Mariam, thanks so much for taking the time to talk to me today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to speak with you. So Writing Jane, Jane Crow is a neat book. When you explain it to st strangers, what do you say about it? What were you trying to do with it? Um, well, I usually start off by telling people it's about Black women and the American Railroad. And um, I usually get people kind of startled because um, most people haven't thought about that particular connection. And I just tell them that I was curious about how Black women experienced the railroad um, throughout history, throughout um, the 19th and 20th century. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. um, from there, I always get questions about, well, how did they experience yeah. it? Um, is it similar to African-American men? You know, what were their differences? So I think most people are just kind of um, surprised uh, because they haven't really thought about um, that particular connection between Black women and this really important form of transportation. Mm -hmm. 
How did you come to write it? I mean, how did you kind of get started down this? Uh, I don't know. I won't make too many railroad metaphors uh, while we're doing this. Uh, but like, how did you get started down the tracks towards this book? Um, well, you know, I was doing some work at the Newberry Library in Chicago. I love that um, place. It's really wonderful. Yeah, I love it. It's a, a wonderful um, library and public library. Anyone can go in and do research there. Um, so I was doing some research on the Pullman Porters, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. I came across some information about a woman who was applying to be a Pullman maid. Um, I guess I should mention that the Newberry Library is really unique in that it has a really large archive on um, the Pullman Company, which is this really important um, train company in the 19th century, late 19th century. Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. they were really famous for their Pullman porters, um, African-American men who um, provided service to passengers in the Pullman compartment. Um, the very well-known um, labor uh, group. Um, so I was just really surprised when I came across this file that had a uh, photograph of an African-American woman, uh, had her application. And um, I was just curious about, you know, who was this woman? Um, you know, how did the Pullman Company employ African-American women? And I think most importantly, I was curious about why I had never heard of the Pullman Company made. And that particular question just led me to think in um, more expansive terms about Black women, um, the railroad, and how there's this really large absence, I think, in our collective knowledge mm -hmm. about um, the train and African-American women. I think the train has such an important resonance in our sort of understanding about the United States and the American nation. Yeah. Um, but when you think about those sort of um, national narratives um, about the train in U.S. culture, very rarely do we think about um, how African-American women uh, intersected with this um, um, form of movement. Mm -hmm. So that was one of the main things I was trying to um, tackle mm -hmm. in the book. Just, you know, one, what were the experiences of Black women like in the 19th and early 20th century? And two, uh, trying to come to some, to some sort of understanding about, you know, why that question hasn't really been um, asked as frequently mm -hmm. um, when we talk about the railroad in the United States. And what got you looking at Pullman in the first place? What were you what were you initially thinking you were looking for in that archive? Well, my past work um, focused on African American modernism. Um, and I was thinking for uh, a future project that I would do something on technology and African Americans. Um, and so I was planning to investigate um African Americans and things like the telegraph, um, the telephone, mm -hmm. and of course the railroad. Yeah. Um, and so my my work at the Newberry initially was uh, in an effort to sort of uh, figure out uh, what I wanted to study in terms okay. of African Americans and technology. Uh, so I just sort of we I still need that book, by the way. Someone needs to write that other book you were starting down there. I, it's um, it's there in the. <laughs> Hopefully in the pipeline. Good. I love yeah. that. I'm, I'm very excited to hear that. I really feel like we could just systematically go through all these major modern technologies and just look at the black experience because it's so often just not written about, you know? I mean, right. we, there's Mia Bay, there's you, there's folks, there's Gretchen Soren. We now have these histories coming out, but there's still so much to do. So, yeah. Right, exactly. And I know your work also <laughs> deals with uh, travel and technology. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, one of the places you start in the intro is just like looking at, you kind of just show the gap in the literature. So you look at Leo Marx's The Machine in the Garden, this very famous history mm -hmm. of technology um, and how it fits into American culture and meaning and symbolism and such. And then Wolfgang Schivelbusch is The Railroad Journey, another very famous book on railroads. And like, you know, just like the black experiences alighted in these things, very briefly mentioned. 
Uh, and but black women are barely there at all, right? I mean, is this what you find when you look at the literature? Yeah, and I think with those two particular examples, it was really, um, I mean, quite obvious or evident to me that um, there was a absence of, um, if not African Americans in general, definitely African American women. Yeah. And I should note, you know, both Marx and Shiva Bush recently passed. Um, yeah. Did you know that? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, I didn't put that together, though. I mean, I knew they they each um, they each died fairly recently. But yeah, I didn't even think about the, the connection there when I was reading your book. That's interesting. Yeah, I think Marx passed away last year. Yeah. And Shiva Bush passed away probably a couple of weeks or a yeah, a couple of months at most ago. Yeah. 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 Um, but yeah, these are two very influential um, examinations of the railroad. Yeah. Um, and I really love Scheibelbush because the way he talks about the sort of subjective experience yes. of riding the railroad. I mean, um, if anything, I was, I was trying to sort of tap into that sort of subjective experience. Um, and I, I think his book provided a kind of model for cool. you know, speaking about those more ephemeral elements yeah. of technology. Uh, so I really, I love um, both of their works, but um, yeah, I was just really uh, troubled by the absence mm -hmm. of Black women. And, you know, I was just curious about how would their arguments be revised or reshaped um, if um, Black women somehow um, made it uh, yeah. into their pages. Mm -hmm. I, I think the way you reconstruct um, the subjective uh, experience of women in this book is really interesting. And you do it a, in a whole bunch of ways we're going to kind of hop through uh, as we move on. Um, can you say a bit about uh, something you emphasize in your your introduction is that the whole black story is one of mobility and movement going way back before the railroad. So can you set set that up for us a bit that, that, you know, it's true that this is a new technology. It's a very important technology. There's a lot of movement going on before this technology. Um, so tell us about the black experience of mobility. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think mobility is so pivotal to um, African-Americans and their construction of self. Um, I think mobility in and of itself is important for the American citizen. Um, and so I start off by just highlighting um, one, the, the different ways in which the railroad um, reappears in African-American culture from something like the Underground Railroad, you know, this, this term for the um, uh, movement of fugitive slaves from South to North. Um, and I also look at how the railroad impacts our understanding of Black music, mm -hmm. um, blues, um, poetry. Um, and then I just make note of the fact that um, for, for at different moments in African-American history, um, African-Americans have somehow been denied this freedom of movement. So, of course, um, during slavery, um, where the mobility of those who were enslaved were very highly surveilled. Mm -hmm. um, then if we look at um, Reconstruction, we have the development of Black Codes, which regulated the movement of African-Americans in public space. Uh, and then, of course, post-Reconstruction, where we have um, a lot of violence um, directed towards African-Americans, especially uh, African-Americans who wanted to ride in first-class train cars. Mm -hmm. um, so I just think at different sort of, um, there are different sort of inflection points in Black history where African-Americans wanted to assert their right uh, to be citizens of this country. And one way in which that citizenship was um, tried to be, uh, attempted to be denied was by circumscribing their movement, mm -hmm. either in, in public space, um, um, in, transpor in transportation spaces, um, and in different ways, um, black, um, black citizenship has been somehow curtailed 
by limiting their freedom of movement. Mm -hmm. Um, I well, you write you write briefly about it, but you you do write about how the railroad shows up in blues songs, and I really like that little where you did that. So can you tell us a bit about that? I mean, what is what is the railroad in blues music? You know, and you're saying there's a couple different kinds of stories we see in, in blues songs about trains, right? Right. Uh, so we see, we definitely see it in blues songs where um, singers um, might talk about the train as a form of escape. Uh, so jumping on the railroad to perhaps leave, um, an unfaithful partner mm -hmm. um, to escape some sort of harsh uh, environment. Uh, I make the note of how um, Black female blues singers um, sort of have this complicated relationship to the train. Um, and this is something that um, Hazel Carby and Angela Davis uh, actually speak more about, hmm. um, about how the train appears in the lyrics um, of some of the blues songs um, that are sung by uh, Black female blues singers like um, Bessie Smith, mm -hmm. um, Clara Smith, um, just different uh, individual singers. So yeah, That's cool. I, I think... Yeah, and that's actually one of the places where I saw Black female, um, I guess we could say pleasure um, with the train. Um, that was another one of my questions. Um, yeah. It, it seemed like for a, a number of African-American women, their experiences on the train have been so um, tense um, that it was very rare for me to find moments of uh, fun, mm -hmm. uh, pleasure. Uh, on which you find in Chivalbush and these other writings, which is like, there is a lot of people, like other folks are writing about the fun of trains. So it, sta it stands out here that you're not finding that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you write, I mean, you, one of the things you emphasize in the introduction that it plays out in the chapters is you found it helpful to look at the first class train compartment as a space. Mm -hmm. So why was that why was that a helpful space to focus on for your the story you wanted to examine? Yeah, I think the first class train car um it's important both as a physical space but also as a kind of metaphor for um the way in which African Americans are treated on this particular form of transportation. Um so first class train cars were uh, so much better than second class uh, train cars, um, better upholstery, um, it's cleaner, um, people act better. Mm -hmm. um, there's a sort of protocol of uh, etiquette, I guess you could say. Um, those African Americans who could afford a first class ticket, you know, they would want to ride in a first class train car. Um, because of the sort of amenities that are available there. Um, but of course, um, and especially in the late 19th century, uh, post reconstruction, African Americans riding their first class train cars were sometimes forced off, um, sometimes very violently. Um, and um, I, I think, especially when we think about black women, um, there are train cars, first class train cars known as lady spaces, um, which were train cars sort of set up to um, appeal to the female traveler, primarily middle class or upper class white female travelers. Um, when black women wanted to ride in these first class lady spaces, they were forced off. Mm -hmm. uh, most famously is Ida B. Wells, uh, mm -hmm. who was forced off uh, in Tennessee. Um, and so I think um, just having a Black woman occupy the space of a lady space, uh, and in, when we think about all of these sort of cultural uh, suggestions, I mm -hmm. guess, associated with that particular word of lady, um, a term that um, has not readily been applied to African-American women in our history, mm -hmm. um, I think it was really important for Black women who could afford the first class lady space or a first class ticket 
Um, you know, if they could afford the ticket and they purchased the ticket, they wanted to ride in the first class space. The fact that some of these women were forced off um, led to these lawsuits in which Black women tried to assert their um, their legal right to ride in this particular space that has been reserved for quote unquote ladies. So I think the first class train car mm-hmm. is a, it's a space of um, a, a lot of potential um, confrontations. Mm-hmm. Um, it's the, the ability to ride in the first class space, I think is a sign of um, respectability, a sign of somehow achieving a level of success and you know, being able to ride in that first class space would be a way to have others recognize mm. um, a person's level of, of accomplishment. Mm-hmm. And in some ways, it's a little bit similar to um, our first class spaces on airplanes. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. There's a certain cachet, yeah. I guess you could say. That I was going to use too. Riding yeah. in first class uh, plane spaces. Um, yeah, and just being able to ride unmolested, you know, just to get from one space to another without worrying about being harassed or being thrown off or, you know, possibly being killed yeah. uh, because you're right in that space. Yeah, I wanted to ask you, I mean, you kind of perfectly led to my next question was you coined this uh, idea of situational writing, which is that black experiences depend on it a lot on who else is present. So Play that out for us. What I mean, what's that allow us to see about the experience of these women? Well, I think so much of the black train riding experience um, was very contingent upon yeah. you know, so many factors. One, would the would a white conductor object right. to having a black person riding in a particular space? Would the conductor um, somehow force a black passenger out of a first class train car if a white passenger complained. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, would there be white passengers who would want to get a black passenger off? So I think so much of the train riding experience for black people was really um there's a there's a large sense of uncertainty. Yeah. Um because even if you study the laws, the uh, the segregation laws, you know, some states did not, um, some states and also some train lines did not um, uh, follow um, segregation rules mm-hmm. um, for, you know, all uh, all train cars and, and all places. So there's just so much, there was so much um, uncertainty and yeah. contingency involved with riding a train as a black person, that's why I called it sort of the situational, um, a situational moment, just depending upon, you know, who's in the car with you. And sadly, like, you know, were they having a bad day that day? Yeah, and, yeah. Um, it just depends no, it on must who have been else. Extremely stressful, right? I mean, just the tension yes. and anxiety of the thing, like you don't know what you're walking into, literally. Right, and anxiety provoking. Um, it's just, uh, that level of constantly being on guard. Mm-hmm. Um, that was something I also wanted to, um, sort of raise. And a number of people have asked me if, you know, if I see any sort of resonance to the you know, contemporary issues. And I think in one sense, one thing I do see a connection to is, um, y- you know, the, we've seen so readily recently how any sort of encounter an african-american person may have with law enforcement right um that sort of uncertainty about what can happen some sort of innocuous uh innocuous uh event can somehow end uh in the death of another person i mean i i i I know i recognize the differences of Mm -hmm. course yeah um, but I do think that sense of not knowing, you know, any any wrong movement can somehow end up harming, you know, a person just trying to go about his or her day. Um, I, I think that sort of sense of not uh, having full control over what could happen to you, I think, yeah. 
that uncertainty and anxiety uh, is, is definitely something I see with uh, more contemporary events. Yeah, I totally hear what you're saying. And I see it too. Um, you So your first chapter examines the writings of black intellectual, female intellectuals who talk about trains. So there's Ann Julia Cooper, Mary Church Terrell, and then a, a little bit of Ida B. Wells too. And so, you know, you've kind of just spelled out for us like the experience, right? That that black women so often had because it was so, you know, there's so much tension and uncertainty there. I mean, how did these women's writings allow you to kind of flesh that picture out? Yeah, I, with Vera, I was really curious how so many of um, these black female intellectuals at the time somehow referenced their difficulties traveling by train. Mm -hmm. um, and there are other uh, female authors I could have included. I, I made a brief reference to Frances Harper. Um, you know, the, just this, um, there was this, this repetitive um, concern about being able to travel and not be harassed in some way. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so I, I the, the fact that so many of them reference that particular experience, I think is important because it's, it becomes very fundamental to how they talk about their work, um, how they present themselves to other people. And so with Anna Julia Cooper, for example, um, in her book, A Voice from the South, I think it, it's very significant that, you know, she talks about what they call national courtesy, you know, being able to be respected when she travels far from home. Um, and one of Anna Julia Cooper's most famous um, uh, passages from that book uh, is when she walks into a train station waiting room and she states that she sees two different signs, one sign for ladies, another sign for colored people. And she wonders under which sign uh, should I enter? Um, and a number of people have taken that moment as a sort of early articulation of intersectionality hmm. um, where the two signs seem to, um, they don't really allow for uh, the multiple elements that make up her identity as an African-American woman. Hmm. Um, and I think also when we take a look at, say, someone like Mary Church Terrell, um, who, you know, not only wrote about her train travel experiences in her autobiography, but also makes references to her difficulties in her diaries. Um, she wrote this short story um, that uh, was never published. Uh, but it was very much based upon her own experiences traveling by train as a college student and being harassed. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think the fact that so many of the Black women um, writing and lecturing during the late 19th century, the fact that so many of them talked about the train experience and how it impacted them yeah. personally I think it's an, an important sort of paradigm mm -hmm. um, that sort of shapes um, their writings and how they talk about um, uh, trying to, quote unquote, uplift mm -hmm. uh, the race. Mm -hmm. Can you say a bit about the, uh, the, the your second uh, body chapter is about lawsuits around ladies' cars? And you've already kind of talked about it with harassment that these women focus. But can you can we just kind of for listeners that don't know, I mean, like what the meaning of the lady car, ladies car was? I mean, why was it there? You know, what why does it exist and what was the meaning of it in culture generally? Um, well, I think the ladies car um, was a certain kind of first class car mm -hmm. um, sort of presented to female travelers so that they wouldn't have to worry about. Um, being approached by strange men, um, possibly being uh, scammed or uh, have um, items um, pilfered from mm -hmm. their person. Um, so it was a very sort of protective space, um, a, a space that was comfortable uh, for people traveling um, 
from one place to another. Um, and I think the whole concept of the ladies' car, you know, it signifies a level of respect, a uh, level of deference mm -hmm. uh, given mm -hmm. to uh, the white middle class or upper class woman. Um, there were a number of black women who, when they tried to ride in the first class train car or a lady space, they were ejected. Um, as I mentioned, Ida B. Wells is probably the most famous one. Um, but there were other women who uh, sued. Um, and in some cases, these African-American women won their cases. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting is that a number of the women won their case, won their cases um, before Plessy versus Ferguson. Uh, and for those people who are really interested in this particular topic, uh, I think a really good resource is uh, Barbara Wilkie's um, and of course, now I'm, I'm blanking on the title, but Barbara Wilkie is a legal scholar, a legal mm -hmm. historian, uh, and uh, she has a whole book on some of these lawsuits that oh. Black women initiated. Okay. Um, well, she's kind of. And one other thing, can, yeah, um, I, I should start off that chapter by looking at um, this sort of repeated scene of um of white men somehow mistakenly kissing yeah i was gonna ask women. you about that next i'm glad you brought it up so these like these films uh, right you call them they're called like race switching comedies yeah so um and what happens in them is that a, a, a black woman and the white women are somehow traveling together there is a white man who is interested in somehow stealing a kiss uh, from the white woman. The train enters a tunnel, and uh, once the once the uh, train exits the tunnel, um, we can see that somehow the white woman and the black woman have switched places, mm -hmm. and the mm -hmm. white man ends up kissing the black woman. And um, it, it's presented as a kind of comedy. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But I also make the point that it's a comedy at the expense of the black woman. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there's something about the ability of the black and white woman to switch places. Um, there was something about that that I think troubled people. Uh -huh. The fact that a white woman, that a black woman could possibly uh, somehow occupy the space that uh, is traditionally granted or given to white women. Mm -hmm. In fact, you 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 also make a large argument that um that there's something about black women moving that there's a kind of sexualization of black female mobility going on, and so tell us about that. I mean, what how is it that like women black women are constantly being sexualized as travelers? Yeah, there's um well there are two different ways in which I tried to flesh this out. Um, one was, I, I looked at a figure um, by the name of Jane Brown. Um, Jane Brown was a, a light-skinned Black woman uh, of Corinth, Mississippi. Um, she tried to ride in the first-class train car, and the conductor forced her off um, very violently. She sued, uh, and the conductor and the train line made the argument that the reason why she was forced off was because she was um, a prostitute, mm -hmm. that she was um, you know, selling her services. Mm -hmm. And one of the main reasons why she had that sort of reputation was because she was frequently seen about the train station, um, selling food to train passengers. Um, and there was something about highly mobile black women, mm -hmm. um, women being present at these spaces of mobility that suggested some form of criminalization, mm -hmm. um, that their, um, their movement somehow facilitated a transactional, um, a sexual encounter. Yeah. Uh, and so I was trying to sort of flesh out that 
that sense that highly mobile black women, somehow there's a sort of threat yep. associated with that. And that in the most part, some, some form of that threat is of a sexual nature. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, you also had a chapter on these black waiter carriers, uh, which was n- totally new to me. I, there was another book on these folks earlier. Is that right? Right. That you were... right. Um, there's another book called uh, Building Houses Out of Chicken Legs okay. um, by uh, Psyche Williams Forson. Okay. And it, I got that wrong. It might be Psyche Forson Williams. Uh-huh. But a uh, wonderful scholar at uh, the University of Maryland, um, a food studies scholar. Okay. Um, and uh, her work first brought the uh, the uh, experiences of waiter carriers to wider public attention. Mm-hmm. And waiter carriers were um, women who sold food to train passengers, um, stopped at a particular location um, before train cars had dining cars. Um, okay. And so they were really important for uh, very hungry passengers yeah. who might not have brought food along with them on a train trip. Um, and so I looked at how um, these waiter carriers in Gordonsville, Virginia, um, just probably about 20 minutes uh, away from Charlottesville, Okay. Um, how these waiter carriers developed um, a strong economic presence um, at a train station in Gordonsville. Mm-hmm. Um, and their presence was so strong, in fact, that they were a competition for um, some of the other uh, eating establish- establishments near the train station. Um, and I look at their history, um, how they were forced to sell first from the platform, then they had to sell on the very train tracks. Yeah. Uh, and eventually they were banished from selling altogether, primarily because of a um, white, politician who had a restaurant okay um near the train station and didn't want to have to compete with um their sales Mm -hmm. um and so again a very um an important element of black women in the train but i think um not as widely known yeah um, as i thought it was cool and you had so many neat sources there's a lot of cool imagery throughout the whole book but i really love the the imagery in this chapter especially and how it kind of allowed you to draw draw out kind of like the you you start from the images, but then you try to reconstruct like what's going on from their point of view, right? Is that fair? Yeah, and I think um, I'm very visually orient oriented. Mm-hmm. Um, I think my my previous work has examined photography um, and artwork, and um, I was just curious about you know, some of the visual Mm -hmm. representations of black women in the train. And I think, I think particularly in that chapter, we have some really great photographs of the women selling from the train tracks. Um, One of my favorite photos is of a waiter carrier trying to sell food to a passenger who's leaning out of the window. And as she holds this tray of food, um, the passenger is leaning out, but he's looking at his watch um, and so you could just see the sort of um, this juxtaposition of what a train passenger is worried about, you know, time and like, is the train on time? Mm-hmm. And the concern of a woman trying to um, sell food to this passenger who, you know, it, it isn't really giving her his full attention. Yeah. Um, yeah. There was something else I was going to ask you about. Oh, oh, this uh, Gordonsville, Virginia. They have a they have a chicken festival even today. Is that right? Yeah, they do. Yeah, they yeah they have it every year in May. Okay, and I realize I just once again I missed it. I I do plan on some at some point going. I want to go too, man. The, yeah, we should meet up there. <laughs> yeah, um, so it's a big event. And, yeah. Um, it's important for the tourist economy there. Yeah. Um, and they are, they celebrate it now. And mm-hmm. it's interesting because when the waiter carriers were actually selling in Gordonsville in the late 19th, early 20th century, um, there was a concern about the women creating a negative mm-hmm. perception of the town. Um, and of course now it's, 
quite different. The irony is thick there. <laughs> yeah. Um, you also have a, a a chapter on the Pullman Pullman um, car company and uh, the maids that are that worked in these cars and archives. But you also, before we get to the end of that, you you also talk about like um, how Pullman cars were expensive. Were, were were obviously they were expensive. They were, they, but they were really important to black people who could afford them. And you mentioned some people like Du Bois and others who. So can you tell us a bit about the Pullman car and like where it kind of fit in African American life, both as kind of labor, the labor side of it, and then you know if you could afford it we know what that meant. Yeah, yeah, and I think most people are familiar with how the Pullman Company was important for um, African-American men who mm. became, <clears throat> excuse me, Pullman Porters, um, enabling a sort of um, middle-class status um, for African-American men. But I think the Pullman compartment was also important for travelers who could afford a Pullman space. Um, it was important because it was a way for them to travel in some form of comfort. Um, so those African-Americans who lectured widely, for example, mm -hmm. Booker T. Washington or W.B. Du Bois, um, being able to travel by a Pullman car was um, something really significant because they could relax, uh, they could get work done. Uh, and most importantly, if they had a Pullman compartment and if they were... Um, you know, if they could pull the curtain, um, they wouldn't be harassed by white passengers. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so it was there is definitely a benefit uh, to the Pullman compartment, both as a uh, black male laborer and also for black travelers. Mm -hmm. And so tell us a bit about, I mean, like you've, you've part of your adventure started with finding this application of this black woman working at the Pullman thing. And then part of the chapter is about the, the, the silences in the archives, right? So what were you able to see and what did you kind of have to read between the lines to see in, in this chapter on the, the maids? Yeah, I think that's an important question. Um, is one one of the challenges to writing this book was, um, you know, just trying to grapple with the fact that initially, when I had this question about black women and the railroad, initially I felt okay. Well, there's nothing there. Um, you know, wh where where am I going to go to find this information yeah. that uh, of, of black women traveling in their um, how they experienced it. Um, and one of my larger arguments is that, you know, just as a number of Black female intellectuals were uh, forced off of the first class train car, um, there's a way in which our archives about the railroad and the train, um, there's a way in which Black women have somehow been forcibly left out mm -hmm. of the sort of archival um, history of the railroad. So I was trying to make um, uh, an argument about the train car and the archive in both its material aspects as well as more metaphorically mm -hmm. um, that, you know, in order to find out this information, you know, we have to sort of like read through the margins. Yeah. We have to um, be willing to sort of look in unusual places and, you know, sort of interrogate those absences. Yeah. Like what does, what do those absences say? Um, uh, what could they possibly mean mm -hmm. uh, in the context of our, um, our understanding of U.S. transportation history? Yeah, or just the history of technology more generally, right? If we think about the telegraph and all these different systems, uh, you know, I think mm -hmm. there's obvious places to start, like black newspapers. I've done some of that around cars mm -hmm. and other technologies, but, you know, then we have to get creative, right? right. <laughs> yeah. Right. yeah. Is, is there a way that you, um, is there something that you found particularly useful in your work um, when you're studying 
different forms of technology and trying to highlight unusual experiences. Yeah, I mean, for me, so I had, I, I might still do it at some point. I have, I've been thinking about like a book on the si relationship between the civil rights movement and technology. Um, and so I, I just kind of, you know, some of it's now in the Bay and Soren books and other places, but I got really interested in the relationship between black people and automobiles and buses, kind of like de kind of deconstructing Montgomery, going back and thinking about like the space that people lived in and their relationship to technologies. And then what got me started down that road was in, well, in King's memoir about Montgomery and then also in the kind of big histories of the civil rights movement. The um, well, oh, it's the uh, the system that came up of cars, right? The the the, the mm -hmm. carpooling stuff. Uh, yeah. it was really you know, it was King says it was essential for you know the boycott working was creating an alternative system of transportation around um streetcars and buses, uh, and so yeah, that just got me really interested in like in those stories, you know, it's like how what is this? Mm -hmm. How does this work? And what, you know, what I find, and that's why I was so glad to find your book, and I'm glad all these books are coming out that I've mentioned, um, is just the most obvious, obvious historical work that you would start with, like, black newspapers plunking in bus or motor coach or whatever it is, and just seeing what's there. No one's done that work even, you know what I mean? And we're like very few people. And so, yeah, this is what I find is we just need to start off with the basics and then turn to all the, you know, all the wonderfully creative sources you draw on, you know? I mean, there's so much to do then, but we got to start off with like, well, first we have to be curious about what black people were, how they were relating to this technology and just look where you would look and then go from there, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I, I think a, a history of um, African Americans in the automobile is definitely something worth pursuing because yeah. um, so many African Americans have talked about how having their own car. Yeah, um, right. Just not having to worry about, you know, people harassing you on a bus, you know? Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Totally. Um. Your, your conclusion talks about this interesting person. Is it Polly Murray? Is that how you say the Polly name? Murray. Yeah. So, right. I, you know, tell us a bit about Polly Murray and also what Polly Murray's story of the, you know, of the train allows us to see about the train. I thought it was, you had some really fascinating points in that conclusion. Yeah. Polly Murray is a really incredible person, uh, poet, scholar, priest, um, uh, very early was interested in um, homeowner treatment uh, to have uh, their identity, uh, to have the uh, identity that they uh, desired. Um, I look at Polly Murray, uh, who actually coined the term Jane Crow. Mm -hmm. Uh, Murray did legal work, uh, received a law degree at Howard University. Um, and in their legal research, came up with the term Jane Crow uh, to help explain um, gender and sexual discrimination. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, Murray used the term, you know, in a legal aspect, um, but I examined how uh, Jane Crow, you know, obviously a sort of it's not just the feminized version of Jim Crow, mm -hmm. um, but it's that a way of looking at uh, all of these different travel experiences that I investigate uh, throughout the book. Mm -hmm. um, but what's interesting about Polly Murray is that um, when Murray was young, uh, a young adult, Murray identified um, as male mm -hmm. and um, wrote about their different experiences hopping freight cars. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mentioned before about how rare it was to find some sense of pleasure yeah. uh, in a train running experience. Um, Polly Murray was one other place where I found a sense of, mm -hmm. uh, sense of freedom, a sense of, uh, you know, all of those sort of romantic yeah. notions we have about the train. Uh, curiously enough, I found elements of that sort of romanticization 
in some of the discussions about the train that Polly Murray presents. Um, and and so what that I allows you some, to draw um, out is the gender side of it, right? Right. Yeah. And um, I think that particularly because Murray, um, by identifying as male while hopping these freight cars, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. there's, there's a way in which Murray sort of taps into this idea that um, for black female train riders, there is that heightened anxiety yeah. that we talked about before. Right. Um, and I think presenting as male, you know, offered a, some level of protection um, yeah. while while traveling. Um, and curiously enough, um, there are these two photographs I have of Murray. Um, you know, one of Murray dressed up in a, a sort of Boy Scout uniform mm -hmm. that I included in the book. And then another image of Murray climbing up a freight car um, around the 1930s. Um, so again, I, I think there's something about the visual image of actually seeing Murray uh, on the side of a freight car. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and we talked before about the different kinds of train compartments. I think the freight car is uh, very distinctive because it's, you know, it, it doesn't have the sort of class connotations. Yeah. First class, second class. Um, and there is a sense of um, sort of blue collar element to the freight car. Yeah. You know, it's there's something very utilitarian about the freight car. But it also um, allows this, this pleasure to come out. Right. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. I thought it was great. Mariam, thanks so much. I mean, I, you know, I really thought, you know, I like to have books that I think have clever methodological things going on, you know, like clever use of sources and. I really, I really loved all the different kinds of sources you draw on and in very creative ways, I think, to stitch together this story, which is not easy to tell because I, I think, that, you know, it's a very, it'd be a lot different if it was about elite white dudes in the first class car. That would be, we could do that pretty fast, you know? So anyway, thank you so well, much for writing this great book and for taking the time to talk well, to me. Thank you for having me. I really enjoyed speaking with you and... Hope you enjoyed this episode of our podcast. You can reach us with questions, comments, and suggestions at leevinsel at gmail.com or by following me on Twitter at STS underscore news or on YouTube at People's Things. Our podcast is distributed by the New Books Network, the leading platform for academic podcasts so that you can find us wherever you get your podcasts. Peoples and Things, like most things in this world, depends on the work of many people. I want to thank my brother Jake Vinsel for writing the music for the show. I want to thank my buddy Juliana Castro for designing the logos for the podcast. You can check out her work at julianacastro.co. Joe Fort is the producer for the podcast, and Mandy Lamb is the production assistant. This podcast and other Peoples and Things programming are produced in affiliation with Virginia Tech Publishing and supported by the Center for Humanities and the University Libraries at Virginia Tech. For information about other podcasts from Virginia Tech Publishing, visit publishing.vt.edu. For the entire Peoples and Things team, I am Lee Vinsel. And most importantly, I want to thank you for listening. Thanks. <laughs>